The Human Experience, Inside the Humanities at Stanford University, humanexperience.stanford.edu. What I want to do is talk about um, about three points that are that are on my mind. Um, one has to do with um, what IHAM uh, has has become to be about. Um, as you know, I won't go through the long history. It's nearly a hundred years of freshman education at Stanford, but it's taken on. Uh, a very different character over the years, cut from the same cloth as the core curricula at Chicago and at Columbia that is going back to the 1920s. It's changed. It's evolved here in different ways. Uh, and in, in brief, I think it's evolved from a curriculum directed at particular material, that material's changed over time, toward a teaching program oriented toward skills acquisition. And the big uh, transition in this history had to do with the Western culture debates and the shift from Western culture, as the program was once called, to CIV, the predecessor to IHEM. Because with CIV, um, what developed was a requirement to take something from a list rather than a requirement to learn a particular material. That's the point where the faculty consensus that a particular set of ideas, texts, materials had to be learned disappeared. That consensus was, was shattered. And when we can, wrote the um, self-study of IHAM in 2007, seven, I concluded uh, with the with the, with the question as to whether this form of gen ed, a kind of core curriculum gen ed, is sustainable in a effectively post-canonic environment. And I think it's probably not. Right? I think it's a very, very difficult argument to make to a freshman. Why do I have to take this course if I could just as well have to take that other course? Right? If you, the faculty, can't say you all have to read this, why do you say, well, you have to read one from this list of 10? There's an answer to that, but it's a complicated answer, and I think it really stretches the patience of the 18-year-old. Seriously, uh, the 18-year-old who's entering the university sees this wealth of material. Why, why am I trapped in this? It's a hard argument to make. Um, the, um, this, uh, this shift to a skills argument in defense of IHOP, is a way to solve that problem. We're not going to defend a material. We're not going to say to be an educated man or woman, you have to have read Hamlet. But we want you to be able to interpret, to argue, to, to write. This wasn't only an opportunistic uh, argument. It was consistent with the na national shift toward a focus on student learning. And I think that uh, IHAM has been in the forefront of, uh, of trying to institutionalize that student learning pedagogy at Stanford. And I know it's been in many ways a, uh, a game changer by, uh, by, um, by disseminating a new attitude toward teaching among the faculty at the research university. Uh, this is consistent with the comment that someone made this morning about note taking. Students come to the university, had no idea how to take notes, have no idea how to listen to a lecture. Many students have no idea how to participate in a discussion, depending on what kind of background they, they come from. We need a gateway pedagogy, whatever you call it, that provides students with these skills. And of course, the skills get deeper, too, all the hermeneutics, all the interpretation. Just, uh, just uh, yesterday, I was working with a group of sophomores uh, in a um, sophomore college uh, comp lit course, and they were still struggling with the idea, do we care what the author meant, or do we look at what the text says? Right. And th th these, kinds of, these kinds of method issues, which are really basic building blocks, they're not bringing them, the, uh, them, with, uh, they're not bringing them with them from high school, and that's why we need this gateway skills building course, uh, whether they read Hamlet or whether they read anything else. Um, of course, one could talk about this shift from a pedagogy focused, well, no, from a curriculum focused on specific materials, a core set, a core list, 
to one um, based on skills. That's the big shift from a century ago. You had to learn this stuff. Now you have to learn to do these things. That's not, not, not bad. I mean, it's a shift from the era of um, you know, once upon a time we made cars, right? and you know, now we make chips. Uh, once upon a time you had to learn this stuff, and now you have to be able to do these things. I think that's not a bad, bad development. But one of the, and this is my second point, one of the se uh, key skills that, um, and I don't use that in any kind of limited or pejorative sense, I'm not afraid of the notion of skills. One of the key skills that uh, IHAM uh, has um, as part of its mission, really as the core of its mission, I believe is, uh, is literacy, is, is reading. Uh, I can make an argument that this is, that this is um, essential to, uh, to humanities and humanism so for the past uh, six centuries. Uh, it's been all about reading in one way or another. Uh, I'd certainly make the argument that it's, at Stanford there's been a division of labor between IHAM and power, with power primarily focused on writing and IHAM primarily focused on, on reading. Um, the, that is to say that my defense for IHAM is not primarily about critical thinking, which is um, a stand-in for a set of, set of other terms, which I believe students can get in other, other, uh, other sectors of the university. I cannot look my, my, my natural science colleagues in the eye and say, your students don't learn how to do critical thinking, only we humanists teach critical thinking. That, that, that won't work, but what we can argue is that we pay attention to reading skills. And by reading skills, I really mean almost back to basics, being able to look at sentences on the page, figure out where the, not necessarily in a grammar police mode, where the subject and the object is. What I hear from current uh, fellows is that students coming out of, out of high school and freshmen in college are high school students plus half a year. That they, that they have a hard time with hard sentences. They have a hard time with vocabulary. They have a hard time following an argument over several pages. And what we're able to do in IHAM, when it works, is have the fellow take the student, metaphorically, by the hand and lead them through the clauses and lead them through the thickets of paragraphs and learn how to do that. What you get out of that is not mastery of the full book by any means. But what you do is give students the the equipment to, um, to be able to read on their own eventually. It's almost like a driving lesson, right? That's it, right? It's like driving school. It's driving school through the thickets of sentences. Right? And, 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 I, and I think that's a, an important thing, particularly because of the character of the diminished um, literacy skills that students are bringing to college today from from K-12 as it really exists in the United States, um, uh, let alone the problems of students working in, in second language is a separate issue. But uh, I, I fear that many, um, many faculty far away from, from undergraduate education imagine today's students to be, um, to be as good as they imagine themselves to have been. Right? 20, 30, 40 years ago, right? So there, there are multiple levels of delusion here. Uh, but you have to just sit in that classroom with a freshman who just can't get to sentence two from something simple because their, their, their reading habits are otherwise, with all due respect, right? Harry Potter, where the toughest thing they read in high school was uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, and they can't get through those, those complex sentences, not necessarily from high literature, but, uh, but in a scholarly article. Surely you'd hope that a freshman in college, after a year, would be able to make his or her way through, a, through, the, through the prose of a scholarly article. They can't at the beginning. And unless we have a pedagogy that gives students that ability, they're going to flounder for the rest of, the rest of their time at college, or they're going to go into fields where reading is not a desideratum, or it's not necessarily negative, but it's just not, it's just not pursued. I believe, we haven't done a census of this at Stanford, I believe that students who don't major in the humanities don't read after freshman year. 
They're doing something else, or they read only very minimally. Michelle, this should be a project. Huh? Um, um, and part of this is a function of uh, this is a function of uh, of, of um, this is this is not an accident. This is not about democratization. This is not about uh, you know the wrong people coming into college. It's not about that at all. It's about government policy. Uh, since uh, since No Child Left Behind amplified through Race to the Top the spread of the so-called Common Core state standards, it is government policy to diminish the capacity of critical reading taught in in high schools. The goal for the goal for reading in high school, what makes students what they call college ready or workforce ready is, as someone said today earlier, being able to read a manual accurately, being able to read the sociology textbook accurately. It's not about being able to use language in a creative, a critical, an imaginative way. You might, perhaps that uh, prevailed when you went to high school, it is no longer a norm. And in fact, it, it is being excluded precisely by the mechanisms of assessment that are integral to these, um, to these, um, to these policies. Um, so I have big doubts about whether students entering college can read. And I, and I think this, I, I, this is at Stanford as much as any place else. Uh, um, uh, or it may be more elsewhere. Where, I mean, I'm sure there's some 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 effect to the selection mechanism at Stanford, but but too many of our peer institutions, too many of the of the um, of the selective schools, blind themselves by generating narratives regarding the excellence of their students. Huh? Huh? And this is this is the this is the the marketing narrative that serves multiple purposes, with the deleterious. Uh, consequence that we believe they're already educated, therefore why give them the scaffolding that's going to give them access to the complex text? So my third and final point um, regarding, regarding IHUM was really um, demonstrated today. IHUM has been nothing if not a, a fellowship. It's been an opportunity for, um, for young scholars, uh, recent recipients of doctorates, you, um, to, um, to collaborate, to cooperate. Uh, I just spoke uh, earlier, was it this week, to the new crop of IHUM fellows, and I said what makes, the, makes it work is the teamwork. What's makes, and you have to fight for those teams to work, to rope the faculty in to participate in it. And you know, I, I, I do the push as well as the pull. But the, but the point is that this has been an opportunity for, 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 for scholars from different very different fields at, um, at a similar stage in their career to, um, to collaborate. Um, so that's all good, sort of the, you know, you know, the, the kumbaya moment where you, you've collaborated. But uh, there's a, this, is, this is where the, the rubber meets the uh, road. Um, I think that IHAM, as I said before, has made an enormous contribution uh, to education at Stanford by being a change agent for the pedagogy in the faculty at large. It's had a cont contagion. It's had a contagious effect. I think it's also, and it's what I've heard today, uh, corroborates that it's had a contagious effect nationally because you've taken some of this with you and you've modified it to your, your institutions and, and that's all for the good. Um, that is to say, I think we've made progress in the shift toward a um, student-centered learning uh, model of, of higher education. Um, I don't think we could have done this if the original legislation for IHUM had mandated that the sections were to have been led by tenured or tenure-track faculty. That it is precisely the postdoc status that you have, you had, that enabled us to have a productive uh, pedagogy discussion and uh, with the um, IHUM leadership uh, between uh, Sherry and Ellen to, to work with you. Those discussions could not have taken place with tenured faculty members. Right? 
They could not have taken place in the tenure for that. So I wish you all get tenure, right? I, you know, I, I wish you all the best. But I think that there's an argument to be made, and this is what I'm going to disclaim later, that um, <laughs> that uh, in certain, from a certain point of view, uh, tenure could be seen as um, not productive to the quality of student-centered learning. Um, that is a reflection that has implications for Stanford. It has uh, implications um, nationally as well, where, as you all know, the um, percentage of instructors, the percentage of instruction delivered, a slight different way to count it, um, carried out by tenure track faculty has shrunk uh, dramatically. Most instruction is delivered by, by instructors, I will say faculty, who are not on the tenure track. Um, that's what higher education is in the United States today. Right? The expectation of of education being delivered primarily by tenured or tenure track faculty is, is another part of the delusion uh, list that I, that I mentioned earlier. Um, Sherry commented earlier about the moment when she uh, discovered the ability to re-identify with the freshman. Um, I think that successful teaching takes place when there's a kind of electric identification between students and faculty. Um, often one thinks about it in terms of the, the student being electrified by the faculty's commitment, enthusiasm, um, excitement for the material. But Sherry's absolutely right that uh, part of this has to be the ability for the, the instructor, the faculty member, to see things from the student's perspective, or at least to try to, to ask, is this making sense? Right? Can you get close to that? learning ground. Um, I think we've come close to that in IHEM. Uh, and for that, I'm grateful to you. All of the above uh, implies the question, what ails higher education in the United States? And the clear answer is lots. Um, but above all, and this I think is the, the lesson uh, for IHEM, uh, from IHEM, uh, what ails higher education in the United States is just simply um, insufficient recognition of the uh, importance of teaching uh, to build a, a productive student learning environment. Um, when all is said and done, for all of the national discourse about student learning, for all the discussion about, about assessment, um, what counts at salary setting time is, uh, is research produced. What counts at salary setting time is um, the book published. What counts at salary setting time is the job offer from another, un from another institution, and no one was ever hired from one institution to another because he or she was a great teacher. Right? This does not happen in this world. Um, so that research model is, uh, is at odds, I think, with the, um, with the discussion about the quality of, of the student learning environment. This is not an argument against research altogether, but it's a call to think for, toward a recalibration of the relationship between research and teaching in American higher education. Uh, if we're going to do right by our students who are needier than ever coming out of today's high schools. That's, that's the description of the, the crisis that we're, we're in. Um, uh, and I think you know, this is not a, this is not an attack on tenure, but I but I but I but I note with considerable interest that I think we've made lots of progress precisely because of the the the, the role of postdocs in the IHUM program that we could not have made with tenured faculty. That is to say, the more we te we shift that gateway teaching at Stanford toward tenured faculty and away from non-tenured faculty, I fear that we will do worse by the, by the students. Um, now, what, what, um, what makes this a, an untenable claim, though, nationally, is that the difference between tenured and um, 
off the tenure track faculty is not just having or not having a shot at tenure. Of course, the, add to that all of the other degraded character of the working conditions of, of, uh, of non-tenured uh, uh, faculty. This is why the Coalition on the Academic Workforce has the slogan that faculty working conditions are students' learning conditions. So all of you who have um, uh, off the tenure track uh, positions, you know, the issue is, do you have an office of your own? Do you have access to the same resources? Do you have the same voting representation in, uh, in, uh, in faculty governance? There's much uh, hoo-ha about the, uh, the decline of faculty governance in the United States be, uh, in or, as part of a denunciation of the, the corporate university. But to some extent, this is just a decline of faculty governance as owned by the faculty and not by the majority of the instructors. So there's a really, re real, real problematic understanding of democratic franchise in, uh, in the university and within that, within that discussion. In the end, to my mind, the scandal of American higher education is that the, the greater the importance of teaching is to one's job description, the lower the level of job security uh, one, is, one is likely to have. And this is just, this is just indefensible. In any case, um, this is what IHUM le leads me to think about. Um, IHUM has uh, made uh, really important contributions over its duration to Stanford uh, undergraduate education and through you, um, perhaps multiplying across the United States. Uh, one thing that will not change at Stanford is that there will always be a new class of 16 or 1700 freshmen arriving and they're all going to be, or most of them are going to be coming out of high schools, um, and they're all going to need some kind of ramp up into, uh, into, into college. And that existential situation of higher education applies pretty much everywhere. Uh, of course, non-traditional students aren't coming right out of college, but leave that aside. I'm trying to wax rhetorical here. Um, uh, we're always going to have that first-year problem. We're always going to have that entry uh, challenge. Uh, and I have said consistently that there are probably lots of different ways to do this. You all come from different institutions where, where it's done differently, and there are different ways it can be done at Stanford. Um, but it's not clear to me that we at Stanford are going to be able to do it better than we've done in IAM. So thank you. Thank you.